Thank you, guys. Whoa, that's loud. I'm going to be coming over here to do a bunch of uh, uh, work on, on this thing. So I'm going to be kind of moving around um, in this direction because I'm going to be going back and forth between actually running uh, the planetarium with Steve over here. So I'd like to thank President Battles for that introduction and, of course, the Office of Alumni Relations for setting up all of this. This is pretty awesome. And there's a lot of familiar faces in here, a lot of geology majors from Geneseo over here somewhere, and people who actually worked on this project. Some of the students, some of the data you'll see come from some of their efforts. So it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. Um, so what I thought I would do, a lot of people don't know that much about this particular mission. It's called the InSight mission. And this is a selfie of InSight as it's sitting on Mars right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to be sort of going back and forth between the, the slide set that you see here, but also um, this map of Mars behind it that we're going to be moving around. So I'm going to give you just some background of the mission first because um, many people don't really know what Insight's all about. What's the, what's the primary goal of this mission? What's it supposed to be doing? Um, and then sort of give you the science objectives. Now I'll talk a little bit about the landing site selection process because I spent six years of my career, including at JPL and then at Geneseo, actually trying to find the safe place for this lander to get to Mars. And obviously you can see that it worked. We, we, got, we got to a safe place on Mars, but I want to describe that process a little bit. And then you'll get the opportunity to see some of the first results from this mission. So um, these results haven't been released to the press yet. That's going to be coming out on February 24th in a series of scientific papers in Nature. Um, so you'll be able to see some of the first things um, that are coming from this today. So as, we, as I said, uh, President Battle said that it's um, only been a Mars year. So let me advance the slide here if I can see it. Okay, there we go. So what exactly is the InSight mission? So it stands for Interior Exploration Using Seismic Investigations, Geodesy, and Heat Transport, which is a big mouthful, but basically what it means is that the primary goal of InSight is to understand the interior structure of Mars. They call it taking the vital signs of Mars, basically looking at the thermal history of the planet, like the heat history, but also um, trying to figure out whether the, this planet has a core. How big is the core? How big is the mantle? Is there a liquid outer core? All these questions that are essential to scientists. Um, we don't know anything, or at least very little, about the inside of all the other planets in our solar system, except Earth. We have a pretty good idea of what's going on with Earth, and I'll, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so um, like, like we said, uh, it's, it's Nominal mission is one Mars year, okay, which is, if you think about it, Mars actually takes about two Earth years to, to get around the sun. So, um, so we've been there since we've landed in November 2018. We've only been there for about a year. So you're not seeing all the results that are possible yet from this mission. We're only halfway through. Now, this is the, the time period of um, this two, about two Earth years time period for this mission is what's funded by NASA. So this thing could last a lot longer than two years. And you can see that it's, it's got these huge solar arrays on it, these solar panels here. It's basically using the sun to get its power. As long as those solar arrays stay clear, and there's a lot of dust on them right now, but as long as they stay clear enough and we get enough power, this could last for several years. Okay, so this is what we call the nominal mission, which is the funded mission. But hopefully we get more funds to keep it going. Okay, so this is just a schematic of uh, the different instruments. I'm not going to go through all of these. There's a lot of stuff on here that we don't need to talk about, but there are two really, really important instruments that are on board the spacecraft, and doing, they're doing some really cool things. So the first one is this little shield thing, this bubble thing you see right here. Now, it's been placed or put right on the surface of Mars, so it's, it's actually sitting right now on the surface. I'll talk about that one in a minute. That's called a seismometer. I'm going to talk about that. Um, over here, this is what's called the heat flow and physical properties package. I'll explain what that means, but it's basically, you can see it's this little, we call it the mole. The mole goes down through the soil of Mars right here, and I'll explain what the goal is in the mole. So those are the two most important uh, instruments on InSight. And a couple other fun things on here, there's actually this, uh, this twins instrument, which is a wind sensor. This has the most sophisticated meteorological station on Mars that we've ever sent. There's also an air pressure sensor. 
I'm not going to talk too much about the wind, but Mars is a windy place. We've, we've detected all sorts of interesting wind phenomena, meteorological phenomena. Okay, here's a picture of InSight being built. So this is at Lockheed Martin. It was built in Colorado. And I wanted to show this just because you can see the scale of it relative to people, right? So, so the, the solar panels here are a couple meters across. They're pretty big features. And then you can see the scale of the, this is, uh, I'm going to describe this later, but this is a windshield that sits on top of the seismometer. This is the seismometer right here. And then there's some other instruments you can see on the deck there. Okay, so that gives you a sense of how big it is. Okay, now this, I want to talk about the instruments first and then explain what, what's the point of these instruments. What are, what are they supposed to be doing? So, um, first of all, this is, you can see the engineers working on the seismometer. This is before, obviously, it went to Mars. Um, these folks are, this was built in France. So, these are French scientists building this seismometer. This is the windshield. So, kind of going back and forth here between two screens. But this is the windshield over here, which sits over top of the seismometer and protects it from wind. And I'll explain why that's important because the point of a seismometer, if you're not an earth scientist or geologist, is to detect quakes, to detect the shaking of the crust. And so on earth we call these earthquakes. We now have to change our terminology because it's a different planet and we have to call them Mars quakes. So we're, we're there to detect in large part Mars quakes on the surface. And so we need to shield it from the shaking of the wind. We need to protect it from that. So that's what this guy is for here. And so you might ask yourself, you know, why do we need to uh, find quakes on Mars? Well, first of all, before I go to the next slide, we don't know at all whether this planet has active geologic activity in terms of quakes. We, we know Earth has a lot of quakes, but we don't know anything about Mars. So just from trying to see if it's still geologically active. But there's several other reasons I want to talk about here. So first of all, I wanted to show a little quick uh, video of what, what a seismic... A seismometer actually does. Um, first of all, I'll set this up. So if you if you just look at this, just like this, this is the most basic seismometer you could possibly build. But um, you have a, a spring up here. Okay, there's a spring attached to some mass. Okay, so there's a coiled spring attached to a mass, and this whole thing is fixed to the surface of the Earth, or in this case, surface of Mars. Now, when you get an earthquake, there's a shock wave, or Mars quake. There's a shock wave that goes through the crust, and it will shake that spring and shake that mass and this is showing a little pen or pencil in this case this is really old school but it will be drawing a straight line until you get the shaking so let's see if this video works there we go so you'll notice in a moment here a series of shock waves coming through the crust from a quake somewhere this is one shock wave that's what we call a p wave you see the little shake and there's the S wave. Now, the point of this, you don't need to know what a P wave and an S wave is necessarily, but these are, these are shock waves created by breaking of the crust, cracking of the crust along what we call a fault. And so you see the, the, the evidence of that quake by the sort of squiggly lines that you see here. Now, inside of that seismometer on InSight, there is a much more sophisticated version of this. It's so sophisticated, in fact, that it can detect the shaking equivalent to the width of a hydrogen atom. Now, I can't really tell you how big a hydrogen atom is. It's very, very small. It's, it's the smallest, yeah, I'm doing this, but it's not this big. It's, it's much smaller than that, it's microscopic. But the point is it's one of the most sensitive seismometers ever built. And if you're gonna send one to Mars, you better make a good one. So that's the idea there. Okay, so one of the other reasons besides just trying to figure out if Mars has quakes or not is that what we don't know, like I described before, is what the interior structure of any of the other planets really looks like. And, and this one on the right here, the picture on the right you're seeing, is a diagram, a typical diagram of what the interior structure of the Earth looks like. Okay, so we know pretty well that we have this outer rigid lithosphere. This is, this is the hard, cold part of the planet. Underneath that, we've got a layer called the asthenosphere. It's a little bit warmer. And we got the mantle, we've got the outer core, we've got the inner core. So we know that the Earth is broken up into these different spheres, these different layers. And we know this not because we've taken a spaceship inside of Earth, or like in the movie The Core, diving down into the Earth. We've never done that before. We know that from earthquakes. So let me explain how that works a little bit, because this is what we're trying to do with Mars as well. If you look on the, the left graph over here, okay, let me explain this one. We have depth 
beneath the earth, so this is the surface at zero depth, and this is the core at 6,000 kilometers below the surface. That's how far down the core is. And what we know about these shock waves from these quakes is that they, they go through the entire planet. They travel through rock, essentially. And what you see here on this, this, this graph here is this is showing you the speed that that shock wave travels through the rock. Right? So I just want to follow one of these type of shock waves that we call a P wave. This is similar to sound waves. This is the shock wave created that somewhat similar to sound. And we can see that that shock wave speeds up quite a bit as it goes down through the planet. It's, getting, it's going from 4 kilometers per second to, to almost 14 kilometers per second. It's speeding up because it's moving through denser material. But all of a sudden, it slows way down as soon as it hits a certain boundary. And this is what we call the outer core. This is, our outer core is liquid, and these shock waves can't travel through liquid very well. In fact, for what we call the S waves, or the secondary waves, they disappear completely when they hit that layer. The point of this is that these shock waves change their behavior as they travel through different physical materials. And so the goal of insight is to try to make this diagram right here. We don't have that diagram yet. Okay? We'll go to the next slide. So um, this is like the family tree of planets, including Pluto, the dwarf planet up here. But um, this is the, uh, the only interior structure we are confident in. These other ones are kind of models, or I don't want to call them guesses. They're educated guesses. But really, we don't really know much at all about what these look like on the inside. So we've... We need a second data point to understand in general how planets organize themselves, how they form, how they organize, how they evolve. We need more than just Earth. We do have a little bit of data for the Moon, but the Moon is an interesting, unique case, which I'll, I can't go into it right now, but I, if you ask me later, I can explain. Okay, now you might ask, do we, have, do we expect quakes on Mars? And that's not a trivial question. On Earth, our crust, or what we call lithosphere, is broken up into a bunch of plates. Okay, it's like all fractured all over the place, and these plates are sliding around on the surface. Um, they're actually sliding around on the mantle, and they smash into each other, they pull apart from each other, they slide against each other, and they create really big quakes. We all know about the San Andreas Fault and the big quakes that can happen there. It's because of this reason that Earth is so seismically active. Mars doesn't have any plates. It's one big plate. Okay? It doesn't have this, so we weren't sure at all whether or not there would actually be quakes on Mars. Okay? Oop. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that's perfect. So, actually, let's go back. Let's dial it back a couple here. That's too far. Okay. All right, so what I wanted to do now is, Steve, we're going to fire up the, uh, the globe of Mars. So if you're sitting over there, you're just going to kind of have to look straight up if you want to see this. Okay. Totally cool. All right, I'm going to come over here. I was trained on this now, officially. Okay, let me go to the controls, right? You want, what do you want to do? Rotate? I'm going to rotate it, yeah. Go to date and time and use time. Ah, there the we go. Time. That's so right. Perfect. Motion. Okay, so what I want to do is get you a little familiar with the geography of Mars. So right there, that's InSight's landing site. You know, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but I'm going to slide this a little bit. Oh, looks like InSight itself is going somewhere, Steve. Uh, Let's not do that. You want to slide? Here, I'll turn that off. Yeah, go ahead. We don't want Insight to move. That's, it can't move, actually. There we go. There we go. That's what I want. That's perfect. Okay, so here, I, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just spin it around. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to spin it around a little bit. And what I want to show you, I'm going to get it to a feature on the other side of the planet. You can see the moons of Phobos and Deimos coming around there, which is totally cool. All right. That might be too fast. Slow it down. There we go. All right. Okay. I know the geography of Mars better than Earth, to be honest with you. Okay, there we go. Um, stop right there. Okay. So we want to know, are there quakes? Did Mars's crust break and crack and fracture in the past? And there's actually a ton of evidence that it has. Despite the fact that it's one big monster plate, um, there's lots of cracks and fractures. And what you're looking at now, this is the western hemisphere of Mars. And I'm going to talk about these features in a minute. I'm not going to go there yet. They're really cool. But I want to look at this thing right here. Okay, this is called Vallis Marineris. And what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to rotate it back just a touch. 
the other one? There we go. I want the oh, diurnal. That worked too, though. Okay, I'm going to turn something on called a topography map. And what this is going to show you is the elevation on the surface of Mars. So it's color coded so that the, the red colors, the warm colors, are really high elevation, and the blue and the purples are really low elevation. And now that really highlights Valles Marineris. You see it right there? This is the size, or it's the width here, what I'm doing right there, of the entire United States. So this is, would be California over here, and this would be like Maine over there. That's how big it is. If you stood on this side, you probably couldn't see the other side of the crack. It's so wide. It's hundreds of kilometers wide. And it's over five miles deep, or seven, eight kilometers deep. So it's, it's nothing like the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon would just be a tiny little canyon there, about that big. So this is huge. This wasn't carved by water like the Grand Canyon. This is actually formed by stretching, or what we call extensional stress, uh, of the crust here. So the crust has been cracking open at this location, meaning if you're cracking open the crust, you're creating lots of quakes. In fact, um, one of the interesting things, though, about this is that this is pretty old. So it started cracking about four billion years ago, and it probably stopped around a billion years ago. There's no evidence that it's, that it's recently active. But it does provide evidence that Mars could be seismically active, that the, if we look at other cracks and fractures, maybe there's some movement on those. And I won't show you all of them, but I'm going to talk about a special one later on. Okay, so we're going to come back to that in a minute. So we're going to go back to the... Uh, the slides. Yep. That's a real um, data set, by the way, the, this data set here. It's not just fun colors. Um, it was made by a laser shooting down to the surface of Mars and measuring how long it takes that laser beam to come back to the surface. OK, so we think there may be some quakes on Mars just based on the surface geology. Now, the other instrument is this, this heat flow probe, as it's called, or the, the heat flow and physical properties package. The point of this is to measure, it's like taking the temperature of Mars. In this case, it's trying to determine how much heat is left inside the planet. Okay, so the goal of this, this particular instrument, so you can see there's an apparatus here, and these are the feet that will sit on the surface of Mars. This is the actual probe. And inside of this casing is this thing, which is the mole. And this thing hammers down it's not a drill, it's not an augering mole, it, it hammers down. It can only go through loose soil. It cannot hammer through solid rock. That's a problem. So one of the things we had to find when we chose the landing site is a place on Mars that had loose soil. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But again, the point here is to, to take the temperature of the planet. I got a little YouTube video here to show kind of how this works, and it's going to be relevant for later. So I'll show it now. That's our symbol, by the way. I'm wearing it on my shirt. Um, OK, so before I get started, I'm just going to pause this. The, the insight, this mole, has to get five meters, about five meters, in order to get the temperature of the core. If it's too shallow, it's only seeing the daytime temperature of the sun rising and setting. The sun heats up the soil a little bit. We don't care about what the sun's doing to the soil. We need to get beneath that so we can get the temperature coming from the center of the planet. We want to know how much heat is left on this planet. Earth has plenty of heat. We don't know about Mars. So here's just a, uh, the, the JPL scientists and the Germans who built this. It should be starting shortly. There it goes. Ran a test. And here it is. And you can see the successful penetration of the HPQ in what's called the test bed. This is actually not just dirt we picked up outside, you know, JPL and threw it in a bucket. This is called Martian Regolith Simulate. It's like, it's got a number. I don't remember the number. But it's supposed to simulate the actual regolith, or what we call, regolith is a term for soil on Mars. And it's basically sand in pebbles, basically. And it's pretty loose, loosely consolidated. And this thing was designed to go through that. And it has no problem going through that. So we had to find this stuff. On Mars, this kind of soil is made not by organic processes or anything like on Earth. It's made solely by meteorites smacking into the planet and breaking up the rock into tiny pieces. Billions and billions of years of that. That's how Martian soil is made. Okay. So the next question is, is there heat left on Mars? So we're going to go back to the 
planetarium here. Okay. I'm going to turn off. I just clicked this off, right? Yep. That's right. Okay. I'm going to turn this off for just a second so we can see the real, you know, view of it. I'm going to do diurnal this time. Let's see if I go the right direction. Oh, I think I'm going the wrong direction. There you go. Okay. I'm going to bring it around to these guys right there. This would be awesome in my classroom. Okay. So there are these huge dimples or whatever you want to call them on, on Mars. They're, they're actually coming out at you. They're, they're, they're topographic rises. This is known as Olympus Mons. You might have heard of it. It's the biggest volcano in the solar system. Okay. Volcanoes, of course, are made by the production of magma in the upper mantle and in the lithosphere of a planet. And if you have volcanoes, it means there's a substantial amount of melting going on inside the planet. That means there's internal heat. And then you see these really large volcanoes too. Now, just to give you a sense of scale, this is the size of the entire state of Arizona. And at one volcano, which is, which is absolutely incredible. These are the Tharsis Mons, which are also kind of giant volcanoes. I turn on the, the MOLA color overlay and you get a sense of the scale of these. Um, several tens of kilometers high from, from up here. It's, it's huge. So that's the, we call this the Tharsis region of Mars. I'll just spin it around and show you another volcanic province. There we go. So this is in the western hemisphere of Mars. I'm going to spin it to the eastern hemisphere, not far from where InSight is, in fact. I'll point to where InSight is. There we go. This volcano is called Elysium Mons, and Insight's actually right around here. Somewhere is where it landed, so not that far from Elysium. And there's a bunch of little volcanoes on, on Mars. Actually, they're big volcanoes. These volcanoes are very similar to uh, Iceland or Hawaii-like volcanoes. Okay, so we'll go back to the PowerPoint here. But they're very old. Again, everything on Mars seems to be pretty old, as if Mars was once kind of geologically active, but not so much. And so here's a picture of another volcano. This is a real image, sort of looking edge on. And you can see that it's old because it's actually superimposed by a bunch of meteor impact craters. That's what these things are, which means it's been sitting there for a long time. In this case, about two billion years. It's hard to imagine two billion years, but, but uh, that's, that, that, there was no complex life on Earth yet at that point. It was just uh, basically bacterial life. So we don't know if Mars is still volcanically active. We don't know how much heat is still present. We want this heat flow probe to tell us. Now this has another important uh, implication. On Earth, our atmosphere was produced by volcanoes. You might not realize this, but volcanoes release gas that was trapped in the mantle of the planet. We call it planetary degassing. This is a recent volcanic eruption in Iceland. And what you're seeing here is basically gas coming out of the magma, out of the lava, we call it here. And that gas is mostly water. That water goes into the atmosphere and the gravity of our planet holds that water and holds all the gases in here, like carbon dioxide and other things. It holds it to the planet. Our gravitational attraction keeps it. And there's another story here about a magnetic field and all that, which I won't go into. But, but essentially this volcanism in the heat is essential to the production and maintenance of atmospheres on planets. So if Mars had volcanism, maybe there was an atmosphere that was somewhat like Earth, a little bit thicker than it is today. So let's talk about um, that a bit. This is a picture of Mars today taken from space, from an orbiting spacecraft. Um, and you might not know what this is. The geologists in the room probably know what this is. It's a sand dune, it's a big sand dune. And these are little sand ripples moving across. This image is so good, by the way. If you were standing on Mars in this picture, if you were there, I would be able to see you. And this picture is taken from space, about 300 miles away. So you'd look like a blob, but I'd be able to tell you're there. So I wouldn't be able to tell who you are. But anyway, the point is that, that Mars is a dry desert today. It's not just that it's dry, it's really cold. Its average temperature is minus 40 to minus 50, and, and Fahrenheit, that's about the same. So Celsius and Fahrenheit are almost the same at this, this cold temperature. It can get down to minus 150 Celsius even. That's how cold. And it has barely any atmosphere. The reason it's so dry and cold is that its air pressure is only 6.7 millibars on average, which is about a thousand times thinner than Earth. So it basically doesn't have an atmosphere. It's got a little thin atmosphere that doesn't do much. 
you couldn't breathe, you, you'd die and everything if you were on, on the surface. But, and this is part of the research that I do normally, is, is besides insight, is there's, these, there's evidence all over Mars of dry river channels. They're basically, this is a dry river system that you're seeing here. Okay? And there's no water in it today. And we know it's really old because it's superimposed by all these meteor craters. Some of them are huge meteor craters. They're giant. They're, they're 50 kilometers in size, for example, some of the, these ones. And the pattern of these river channels, any geologist in here will tell you, we call this a dendritic river, river pattern, which is tree branch-like pattern is what it means. And that's typical of rainfall. That indicates rainfall. That means Mars had enough of an atmosphere to have clouds, to have rain, to have that rain get evaporated back up again, to, to basically rain out again. We call it a hydrologic cycle. And so Mars had a hydrologic cycle like Earth. If, if Mars was once Earth-like, maybe Mars could have supported life in, that, in terms of bacterial life and that kind of stuff. So we have a sense that Mars in the past had a lot of heat. We just don't know how fast it lost it, and hopefully InSight will answer that question. Okay, so now we get to the landing site aspect. So that's kind of the justification for, for InSight and why we wanted to send it, why, why, what it's supposed to be doing there. So what I'd like to do now, uh, Steve, if you want to put up, um, we're going to show you the, the launch of InSight. Well, not actually the launch. We're going to show you what's called the trajectory of InSight after launch. So we're going to switch to that here. And it just, it's just going to go InSight launched from Earth last May. There it is, taking off from Vandenberg. Air Force Base, I was there, I couldn't see a thing. It was all foggy. It was horrible. Um, sorry, that's InSight. I'm following Earth. There we go. There's InSight. You knew it. You know what I'm doing. Um, it's keeping, it's actually going in front of Mars. See that? And Mars is going to catch up to in its orbit and finally get there and land safely. That takes about six months. You can actually see that we're getting close to the landing data when InSight actually arrived. Um, but uh, every two years, there's a launch window where those two planets get really close to each other, Earth and Mars. We're actually approaching a new launch window, and the next rover is about to launch this spring. It's called Mars 2020. So this is back in 2018. Oh, we're doing some more stuff here. Okay. Ah, okay, I'm going to show this too in a minute. So there's insight. So actually, see, for time, why don't we, why don't we switch to that? I've got a uh, computer rendition. Switch back to Earth? Yeah, sorry. There we go. Okay, I'm going to click on this. I'm going to show you um, a computer-generated um, rendition of InSight landing. I'm going to fast forward it a little bit. We don't need that. Okay, so this is called the cruise phase of the mission. Oh, let me get off of that. Okay, and see InSight approaching. There it is. So this is a cruise phase. It's solar-powered. InSight is packed inside of that. Now as it approaches Mars, it makes some trajectory correction maneuvers to make sure it's heading to the landing site that we picked. That'd be a good thing. This is called the back shell, and this is called the heat shield. So there's just enough atmosphere on Mars that you're going to get frictional resistance as it enters the atmosphere, and that would melt the, uh, that would melt the lander, which is inside of this thing. So you need a heat shield, but this obviously isn't going to slow it down. It can't just land like this. It's smack right into the ground. So in a moment, it's going to deploy a parachute. But this is a parachute that can withstand supersonic speeds. It's like putting a parachute behind a fighter jet. So it's a special parachute. But unfortunately, that para there's not enough atmosphere for that parachute to slow it all the way down. You can't land on a parachute on Mars. The atmosphere is too thin. So ultimately, you have to drop in sight. And there's a radar under there which is telling you how far you are away. And it's going to land on retro rockets. Okay, and you can see these little chemical rockets right here. This is what actually makes the mission cost so much. That fuel is really expensive and the mass is really expensive. So assuming that we did our job right to find a suitable landing site, it will land safely like you see here. Okay. I'll just stop it right there. Okay. 
You can see the dust cloud created by the retro rocket, so you actually do see evidence of that. Um, but this is the kind of landing site we really wanted, something super flat and smooth. Right. So I just want to show you the type of place that for six years I tried to find on Mars. Um, and this is, this is not InSight's landing site. This is not it. This is another landing site from the Spirit rover. I don't know if you guys remember the Spirit rover. Um, it launched around 2002 or landed around 2002 and lasted until about, I think, 2008 before we lost the signal. And this is a picture of its landscape. It's called the Gusev Cratered Plains. It is flat. It is very flat. This is what we wanted. You don't want a spacecraft to land on steep slopes. It'll just tip over and when it lands and break into you know, a bunch of pieces and there's $400 million down the drain. Um, the other thing you'll notice, there's lots of rocks here. And you might think those rocks look dangerous, but the rocks are only about this big. See my hands? Okay. So there's no scale in here, but they're about 10 to 20 centimeters in size. None of those rocks are a hazard to landing. We were worried about rocks that were a meter plus in size, so this big. Those would certainly have crushed the lander as we landed. Um, so this is a great spot. The other thing that this has, which is really important for the mission, is you'll notice that this isn't just a sheet of solid rock. You know, if you've ever been up the Adirondacks and you see just smooth, slick rock, it's not that at all. This is all broken up into tiny pieces. It's mostly sand with some pebbles and what we call gravel and we call uh, cobbles, which is what you're seeing here. This is that soil I was talking about, what we call a regolith. And in this case, this surface has been sitting there for three billion years. It's an old lava plain that's been sitting for three billion years doing absolutely nothing but being hit by meteorites, which churns up the surface into a soil which is about 10 meters thick. So that's what we wanted. And so we were searching all over Mars, but in this case, looking at satellite photos to try to find this exact sort of location. So we're going to see in a minute when I show the actual pictures whether or not we succeeded in finding this type of landing site. Now you might ask, why didn't you just land here? Sure would have saved a lot of time. We already landed there once. This location is too far south on the planet. So you notice those solar panels on InSight, right? Well, InSight needs a lot of power to do what it, what it does. So we had to land further towards the equator. We basically landed right at the equator. So actually, Steve, why don't we show, can we show that real quick? Yes, we can. Awesome. Might as well do it. I think we're doing okay on time. Yeah. So I'm just going to show you real quick where we actually did land. Perfect. Oh, that's awesome. Actually, yeah, if you just want to turn it, that's perfect. Okay, so this is the equator of Mars right there. So the spot that we found is just a couple, about four degrees north of the equator, and that's in a perfect spot to get enough sun to actually power the lander. Now Mars is really interesting. It's got an axial tilt just like the Earth. It's only a degree different, which means that it has the same seasons as the Earth does. They're just twice as long because it takes twice as long to get around the sun. And so you can see how smooth and flat this is. This is rougher terrain down here, but this is a smooth, broken up lava plain. It looks very similar to the other location that I just showed you, which is actually too far south and not anywhere in this area. But also, InSight landed in here, but Curiosity rover is in here if you're interested. That rover is currently operating. So we're not that far from Curiosity. Yeah, right there inside of Gale Crater, which is kind of cool. Okay, so we had to land near the equator. We also, could you turn on the topography, the MOLA topography there? Yeah. We also had to land in a really low place on Mars. We couldn't land anywhere that's red. We can't land on the top of volcanoes because they're too high. The reason is that parachute. We need enough atmosphere. We have to travel through enough atmosphere to slow it down. And so you have to land in the low places, places in the blue and green, where you haven't, you're coming through a lot of atmosphere and it can decelerate it enough so the retro rockets can prevent it from smacking into the surface. So we couldn't land anywhere down here, anywhere up here. So we ultimately picked you know, that location. It's actually right there. That's exactly where it is. Okay, um, so we're gonna switch to the, uh, back to the PowerPoint. So we're going to look and see if we manage to pull this off. Okay. 
and of course they're happy. So this is the picture taken from uh, inside the, uh, um, the main mission control at JPL. So the EDL, which stands for Entry Descent Landing, is operated by a bunch of engineers essentially. And most of these people that you're seeing in this picture are the engineers responsible for getting it from Earth to the surface. Once it's on the surface, other teams take over. Uh, this individual here, his name is Bruce Bannard. He is uh, the head of the mission, okay? And he's the one who said, I can't post this video until February 25th because um, none of the results have been released yet to the public. So um, anyway, it's beside the point. So Keith, you can see who sent that email. <laughs> All right, so everyone's happy it did land. Um, here's the first picture. It's not a great picture. It looks kind of kind of bad, actually. Um, so let me explain what's going on here. This isn't just a waste of money um, sending a picture here. Uh, but um, first of all, there's the foot of the lander. So this, we got this picture just minutes after landing because there were these two other spacecraft that, that basically tagged along with InSight called Marco, I believe Marco A, Marco B, um, that um, were sending the trajectory information from the lander back to Earth really quickly. Like, so once it landed, it relayed this picture back to Earth and we got it just minutes afterwards. That's never happened before, it was so fast. Um, and what, the reason why it looks like this is because there's a dust cover on top of this camera to prevent the lens from being scratched and abraded by all that dust that flies up when the retro rockets blast the soil, right? It's to protect it. Eventually, most of that dust does in fact fall off. This is a view under the lander and out to the landscape. You can see the horizon in the background. And um, uh, it's got a fisheye lens. You'll see another better picture here in a minute. Uh, we got really excited that there was a rock in the view because geologists really love rocks. Um, I should have my students tell me what kind of rock that is, but uh, it's basalt. Yeah, I heard that. There we go. They knew it. It's a chunk of basalt, okay, which is, means that we landed on a lava plain, which is good. Basalt is a uh, volcanic rock like in Hawaii. I'll show you some better pictures. There we go. Okay. On the left is the InSight landing site. It landed in this place that I, I called Elysium Planitia, which means... Um, basically, Planitia is a plane. And this is the place I said we were looking for. We're looking for something like this. And this is what we got. This picture comes from a camera attached to the robotic arm. Okay? Now, out in the distance, this isn't very far away. That's only 20 meters away, 50 feet away or so. It looks exactly the same. And this, in fact, is the most of the terrain looks like this in the area. So we got exactly what we were looking for, which is great. Um, but you'll notice we actually landed on something even better. We landed on something so smooth and flat that there's no way we could have messed this up. It was super smooth, super flat. I'm going to show you some more about this in a moment, but, but it's really nice um, landscape to land on. We wanted to land on a parking lot and we got it. So, okay. You also notice there's no big hard rock there. All right, so the next thing we did after we landed um, President Battles said that I brought a couple students with me. Um, my job after landing um, was to help the team try to place the instruments on the surface of the, uh, in front of the lander. Okay, so the robotic arm has to reach up, grab the seismometer, and actually physically put it on the ground. That's actually never been done before in the history of planetary science. You think about it. A robot has never done that. And so there's never been need for geologists to sort of tell the engineers where to put these things. Because geologists know how to see rocks. We know how to determine slopes and, and all the things that are unsafe for a spacecraft. So the engineers needed our help. So because I did some of the landing site work, I was asked to actually lead something called the Instrument Site Selection Working Group. I didn't lead the whole group. I led the geologists in the group. And I needed my students with me because they know what to do as much as I do. So this is Alyssa DeMott, who is from Canandaigua. And her folks are here. Right up here, so um, she's not here, she's in graduate school right now. Um, but she actually helped map some of the rocks. She even named some of the rock. I think she's known for uh, pickle rock, actually. Um, but it's real, that's the name of the rock now. So that's pretty cool. And this is Megan Kopp from Brighton. So these are local students who were at Geneseo and they spent a lot of time helping us to figure out where to put these instruments. And this is um, Heather, who's actually a JPL intern, who's also an undergrad. So these three are undergrads. And these folks are the, the team members in the room trying to decide on what's going on. And you see the two of them sitting back there um, watching what we're doing. 
Okay, so we also succeeded in doing this. So what I'm going to show you now is um, the arm deploying the seismometer. Okay, so there's one frame, the next frame. See, it's still kind of dusty here, but next frame, and there it is. So the seismometer is securely put on Mars. This was Christmas time last year that this happened. It actually took us a month to find that spot, basically. Okay, you, the next thing you'll see is the windshield coming down. There it goes. This is actually an animation. There it goes. It just repeats. But the windshield's protecting it, so that was safe. And then the next thing I'm going to show is the, the mole coming down. There it goes. So the arm deployed it. So we picked those spots. We certified those spots and sat in a room and, and gave the famous go, no, go. We go around the room and say, Go, we're go for deployment, go for deployment, go for deployment, super cool. I never got to do that before. Um, all right, here's a picture of InSight from space. So um, this again is from this camera called High Rise, where if you were on, in this picture, I'd be able to see you. Every, you see the little grids, little pixels we call them on here? Each one of those is 25 centimeters wide in real life, okay? So um, what you can see, there's the solar panels fully deployed. That is the seismometer in the windshield. You can see that thing, which is only this, this big. You can see that from space. This is an amazing camera. This ultimately, by the way, is the, the imagery we use to find a good landing site. It's so perfect. Um, and you can see that um, it's, it's actually pretty smooth. These little shadows you're seeing, these little bumps, those are rocks about the size of the seismometer. Um, that would have been bad if, if we landed on those. But they cover less than 1% of the area, so it was acceptable risk. And that's a color picture, by the way. Okay, so now the results. So like I said, we've only been there for a year, and there's a full another year of monitoring, so there will be more results obviously coming, and we're hoping this thing will just sit on Mars for years to come. But I'm going to start very quickly with the geology. Now this isn't a surface geology mission per se, but my expertise actually is in looking at landscapes, surface geology, trying to understand how they form, uh, what's the geologic history of a location based on its surface processes. Um, I'm also interested in the, the shallow soil profile, like 10 centimeters down, like what's it made of, what, what do we see there? And so in this picture, you see that parking lot I was talking about, but there's some cool things. There's obviously these rocks that we want to get a sense of what they're made of. Here's an impact crater, a very small one. It's only about a meter in size, but a meteor must have hit there not too long ago. And then there's a big sand dune in the background about 40 meters away, which indicates that there's sand here and that the wind is blowing. There's enough wind to blow sand across the landscape. And that's actually going to be pretty important here in a minute because, as I mentioned, we landed on this peculiar smooth surface that we're trying to figure out. And actually, this is part of the paper that I'm writing right now. Or actually, I just submitted it, but um, which is trying to understand this. What, what did we land in? What is this thing? And it's best to be described as, I call it a sand trap. It's a place that's trapped the sand blowing across the landscape. In fact, it is what we call a quasi-circular depression. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's circular, but not perfectly circular. It's a depression in that it's about 30 centimeters deep, 27 meters in diameter. And we call it Homestead Hollow. It's actually a name we came up with because we're not moving, it's our home. And it's a hollow, so it's a, it's a depression. Now, based on the geometry of this hollow and ultimately the origin of this hollow, which we think is it's an impact crater is what we think it is. We think we're inside of an old degraded impact crater. We've been able to estimate that there must be two to three meters of sand beneath the lander, which is perfect for this probe. That's what we need to get through. We need just sand to get through, not rock. This is a picture of a bunch of craters. So a couple of my students, including Alyssa and also Julianne Sweeney, did a paper about the morphology of craters in the landing site. Okay, and, and what we notice is that craters actually start fresh, and as you would expect over time, they degrade into things that are quasi-circular depressions. This takes, by the way, Julianne, how, how long does it take? Like two billion years, something like that. Yeah, two billion years to do that. But the point is that you'll notice they're being filled in with, these are sand dunes. It's filling in the sand. So, so Again, that helps the other teams when we say, the geologists go, we landed in a crater, there's two to three meters of sand, you're okay to, to penetrate with, the, with this mole. Okay, 
So I'll come back to that a little bit. Now for the quakes. Okay, so this is actually the big stuff. This is the stuff that really I'm not supposed to get out in the press until late February, but we absolutely have detected quakes. There's no doubt about it, 100%. And they're tectonic in origin. They're, they don't come from any other source. In other words, another possible source for making a quake on Mars is a meteor smashing into the surface of Mars. And we didn't, haven't detected those yet. These are tectonic in origin. And what I'm showing you in the red is the best one that we have. This is an event um, that is about 1,500 kilometers away, a magnitude on the Richter scale of 3.6. You wouldn't have felt it if you were there. It was a really small, low magnitude quake. But what's important about it, and this is for the geologists in the room, there's clear P wave arrival times and clear S wave arrival times, which is clearly seismic in origin. These are two different types of shock waves that arrive during this, during this quake event. Here's another one that was detected at 3.2 magnitude, about the same distance, and kind of have a P and S wave arrival here as well. So those are the squigglies made by you know, the, the, the pen on the paper when, when it shakes. This is just comparing to Earth quakes that are seismic in origin, or sorry, tectonic in origin. These are quake in Greece, much stronger one, magnitude 6.5, and a quake near Gibraltar. But the point is these are very similar in type, and, and the way the the way the waves arrived and the shape and the frequency of the shaking is very similar. So these were created by faults cracking, essentially. Now it gets even better, actually, I think. This is super cool. So let me explain what you're looking at here. So this is a global map of Mars and it's that same colorized terrain map that you've already seen. Reds are high elevation, uh, the blues and purples are really low elevation. And just to get you oriented, there's Elysium Mons and there's InSight Landing Site. These circles are basically what we do in seismology is once we know when the quakes arrived, we can figure out how far away they are. So we draw these circles to say the quake must be this far away and this quake must be that far away. But eventually for a couple of the strongest quakes, we were able to pinpoint the exact location of the quakes. Okay? So zoom over to this bigger picture, or this bigger picture here. And you'll see that the quakes, the strongest, most obvious ones are associated with a feature called Cerberus Fossa, not far off of the, the Elysium Mons volcano. So let's look at that location. That's a picture of Cerberus Fossa. So what do you see there? A giant fracture, a giant crack. Now this wasn't created with one quake. This thing, if you see the scale bar, the image is 60 kilometers wide. So this thing is a half a kilometer to a kilometer with its really big fracture, but it is a young looking crack on the surface of Mars. And we can tell because it cuts across everything in this picture, including this mesa of rock here, just goes right across it. This is made by extension. The, the, the surface is being pulled apart. It's being cracked here. And we're really close to a volcano. Sometimes this happens when magma comes up and splits the crust open. We don't know if that's the case here. This could be not related to magmatic processes at all, but it's really exciting that most of them are coming from this. That's awesome, actually. So this is now the most seismically active place on Mars officially, that crack. Okay, now this is actually probably the most important chart in the whole thing. It's a boring graph, but it's really important for geologists because it compares how seismically active Mars is to the moon and to the earth. The only other two places where we've ever measured quakes. The Apollo mission, they put a seismometer on, on the moon to measure quakes there. So let me explain the graph. On the x-axis here, this is the magnitude of the quake. So this is the Richter scale. Two is a weak quake, six is a pretty strong quake. On the y-axis here is the number of events, it's the cumulative number of events, technically, per earth year. So the number of quakes per year, basically, let's call it that. If you look at the moon, the moon is a cold, dead, small planetary body. It's not very active. And so if you plot the number of quakes that happen of different magnitude, the moon is the least active planetary body we visited with a seismometer. It has no plate tectonics and it's pretty much dead. We had no idea how active Mars would be. So let me skip Mars for a moment and go up to Earth. So the global seismicity of Earth is way up here, and that's because of plate tectonics, because we have all these plates smashing into each other, pulling apart, and we get a lot of big quakes, actually, globally on Earth. We're very, very active. 
But if we look at Geneseo and Rochester and places that are not at a plate boundary, we're nowhere near a plate boundary here, we're in these quieter places on Earth, this is our seismicity right here. Okay? Now, the 13 biggest events, the 13 most obvious tectonic events on Mars, if you plot them out, they plot above the moon but below Earth. So, in other words, Mars is between those two in terms of how active it is seismically. But there's a 174 other events that are really unusual. We think they might be deep quakes inside of Mars. But if we plot those, we're, Mars might be as active as New York State, seismically. Not quite, but close. Okay? That's actually really important. No one's ever made this kind of graph before. We're starting to nail down how active this planet is. Unfortunately, right now, I cannot report uh, any interior models yet. We need more big quakes. What's unusual is the fact that we haven't seen the magnitude 4 on the Richter scale yet. We haven't seen a 5. And that's actually less than is predicted. It's, you see this curve, if I go back here, this curve actually nosedives right here. And maybe we just haven't been on Mars long enough to get the big one, the big one on Mars, so to speak. Um, so we're waiting to see if this curve will continue more like that. And then maybe we can build the models. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is the saga of the heat flow probe. It is a saga. It's been, it's been fun. Um, this is a picture taken exactly a year ago in February 2018 where we started hammering into the ground. So you're looking at the apparatus from the camera arm. And inside, you kind of can't quite see it. It's up here. The mole would be pounding. Yeah, here it is. Okay. So the mole's in here, and it right now has just gone through a hammering cycle, several thousand strokes. It started to go down, it got to 30 centimeters, which isn't very deep, and the whole apparatus started shaking. And you can see how the feet actually slid off where they actually were. You can see they were there, and it slid. That wasn't supposed to happen. Okay? And the mole stopped going down. So we're like, all right, that's not good. Maybe everyone thought, oh, maybe we hit a rock, big, big rock we can't get around. It was designed to go around um, 10 centimeter size rock, but maybe we hit a big sheet of rock. There's definitely soil here, but... So it took several months to try to come up with a plan to, to try to fix this. So what we did was we actually picked up the apparatus with the arm, moved it away to expose what's known as the mole hole. Okay? So we're zooming in on the mole hole right here. And what you'll see is the mole was carving a really wide hole that is about three or four times the diameter of the actual mole itself. That didn't happen in that test bed example I showed you before in the video. So why did this happen? Well, it turns out from testing, this, there isn't a rock underneath the, this at all. It's geology that gets in the way here. This is a soil, sure, it's all sand, but the problem was that there's a little bit of cement holding the sand together. So it's a little bit cohesive. It's got a little stick to it. And what that meant is that the hole didn't collapse in while the mole was going down. And this was designed for the hole to collapse on itself. This mole needs friction, friction to keep hammering. It needs, it needs the soil on top of its head, something to push off of, and soil on the side to get something to shove off of as well. So they didn't anticipate, or we didn't anticipate, there would be some cohesion. And the reason why there's cohesion here is because we're in a crater. And this sand trap, it filled with sand, and then the sand just sat there for 500 million years. This is actually part of Alyssa's honors thesis work. 500 million years, this sand sits there and does nothing. That's half a billion years. And so what happened is it's starting to absorb some of the water vapor from the atmosphere. There's a little bit of water on Mars, not much in the atmosphere. But for 500 million years, it absorbs enough. That water evaporates billions of times, and it leaves behind a little bit of salt. And so the salt is holding this together. We call it a dura crust. So we've seen that in other places on Mars. We just didn't hope, hope we weren't going to land on it inside of a crater like this. So just a couple more slides. I wanted to show you that in October of 2019, this is actually an animation, we decided to put the scoop arm up against the mole to give it something to push off of. And you'll notice once we did that, it started to go back down. So that's exactly what it needed was something to, to shove off of. You can see it again right there. It starts to spin. 
Okay, that's October this this year or well last year. This is this is November. The mold popped back out of the hole. Okay, so this was tested. They they saw this happen a couple times when they tested it at Mars atmospheric pressure, but it didn't usually happen. The problem was some weird suction effect is happening inside this big hole now that every time it gets down to a certain point creates a reverse pressure and the mole pops back out of the hole. So, in an attempt to try to get it back in, we pinned it again, and as of January last month, that's where it is. Still 30 centimeters into the soil, and it popped out a centimeter the other day, but it's all right, you know. Once it gets down there, we're gonna try to pack it in, put some stuff on top, and hopefully it'll start going, because there's plenty of soil underneath for it to go through. So. That's the saga that's cost us several million dollars for the mission to try to fix this, this, this issue, unfortunately, but hopefully it'll be fixed soon. So that is the last thing that I have, and this is a sunset picture taken of insight over Elysium Planitia. It's grainy because it's dark and it's not really great to see, but that's our sun, you know, from several hundred million miles away. So um, please uh, feel free to ask me any questions either now or, or afterwards, but that's it.